Hi everybody, let's have a look at a key labour market imperfection. What monopsonies do to efficient labour market outcomes. We need to start by understanding what a monopsony actually is. Well, a monopsony is the sole employer of labour in a given industry. So the more workers that are employed by one employer, that enables monopsony power to hold. And in the UK there are two professions where we can argue that workers are being employed by a monopsony employer. We think about teachers, we think about nurses in the UK. Both are employed by the state. The state by far is the dominant employer of all workers in those two professions. Because monopsonies have got the significant buying power over workers, we can say that they're not wage takers anymore. They are wage makers. They can set wages, absolutely. And they will maximise the revenue that they bring in from their workers by hiring workers up to where MRP equals the marginal cost of labour. So these two conditions are significant as we now look at how monopsonies work on a diagram. On the y-axis on this diagram we have the wage as we are used to. On the x-axis we have the quantity of workers as we are used to. We have the demand curve for labour which is equal to the MRP as we are used to. And we have the supply of labour. For a monopsony, the supply of labour is equal to the average cost of labour. If you want to understand why that is, stay tuned at the end of the video where I go through a little proof which explains why the supply of labour curve for a monopsonist is equal to the average cost of labour. Now, this is important, this upward slope is important. That tells you that the monopsonist is confined by this supply curve. If they want to employ more workers, Yes, they've got wage-making power, but to employ more workers, they have to increase wages to do so. But as they increase wages, they don't increase the wage just for the individual worker, for the additional worker, no. They increase wages for every worker, the workers that came before as well, which implies that the marginal cost of labour is greater than the average cost of labour, implying, as I've just said, as an extra worker is hired, it's not just that one worker that gets the higher wage. It's all the workers before that get the higher wage. Hence why the marginal cost of labour is upward sloping and is greater than the average cost of labour. So as we said, the monopsonist has got wage making power. They will decide to employ workers up until where the MRP is equal to the marginal cost of labour. At that point, they are maximising the revenue that each worker is bringing to the monopsony, to the firm. And that means that they are going to employ workers at this quantity where MRP is equal to the marginal cost of labour. Right? So that is the quantity of workers employed by the monopsonist. Where do we get the wage from? Well the wage is the supply curve, is the average cost of labour. Again at the end of the video I make that clear. But we read the wage off the supply curve at this quantity and that gives us the monopsonist wage of WM. Let's now compare that to efficient labour market outcomes. Now we know that in a competitive labour market, wages and quantities are determined where demand equals supply, as simple as that. So where demand equals supply on this diagram is here, and that gives us the quantity, let's call it QC, the competitive quantity of workers, and the competitive wage would be here at WC. So now, if we compare employment and wages, we can see that a monopsonist reduces the quantity of workers, i.e. reduces employment compared to competitive labour market outcomes. What we can also see in terms of wages is that they uh, give lower wages than competitive labour market outcomes. So employment is significantly reduced and wages in a monopsony labour market is significantly reduced. And that's very important to consider. What we can also see on this diagram is that the workers that are employed are being paid a wage of WM which is much lower than their MRP. So basically workers are getting an absolutely horrible deal if they end up working in a monopsony labour market under a, mon under a monopsony employer. They are really getting a tough deal. And in the real world, if we can measure MRP, we can compare how low wages are compared to MRP. The lower that wages are compared to MRP, the greater the monopsony power that exists in that market. And for you guys to know that, to evaluate using that, is fantastic. So bear that in mind, how we can measure monopsony power and just how badly efficient labour market outcomes are being distorted. That's how monopsony works. 
actually quite a simple diagram as long as you know how to draw it. The end outcomes are very important, very inefficient, distorting, efficient labour market outcomes. Thank you so much for watching guys, I'll see you all in the next video. Okay, so you guys have stay tuned because you want to work out why the supply of labour for a monopsonist is equal to the average cost of labour. It's actually quite simple and it's exactly the same kind of understanding as why for a monopoly the average revenue curve is equal to demand. Let's understand what the supply of labour actually tells us. Well, the supply of labour tells us the number of workers that will actually work at different wage rates. And we draw it linear and upward sloping. So really our supply curve is just this equation. At different wages, the quantity of workers that are willing to work. But linear, so it takes this form. That is a basic linear equation and that is our supply curve. At different wages, the quantity of workers that are willing and able to work, i.e. that will take the job. And it takes that form because it's an upward sloping linear line. That is our supply curve, simple. We also need to understand what the average cost of labour is. Well, the equation to work out the average cost of labour is just the total cost of labour divided by the quantity of workers. How do we get the total cost of labour? Well, it's the wage of each individual worker times by the quantity of workers. That's the total cost of labour. And then divide by quantity. We can cancel out the Qs and we just get W. So the average cost of labour is just equal to the wage. And if we understand that that is our supply curve, i.e. W wage is equal to A plus BQ, it must follow that the average cost of labour is equal to this. Therefore, the average cost of labour is equal to our supply curve, given that this is our supply curve. So that's why we say that the supply curve is equal to the average cost of labour. And that's why also we read the wage off the supply curve, because as we can see, the average cost of labour is the wage. Hopefully now that makes sense. Thanks so much for watching, guys. See you in the next video.